Old school psychology is a lot of fun. Learning about the old experiments where they trick the participants into doing something silly is probably the first thing that hooks people. It's even more fun when you can spot those effects in the real world. You just flinched, didn't you? Congratulations, you've just been conditioned. There won't be any beeps after this, so you can adjust your volume back. Pavlov's dog, Skinner's box, and even social experiments on conformity where a participant knowingly gives the wrong answer in order to fit in with all of the wrong people around them are hilarious. And interesting enough that they're taught in every intro psych class. But a few of these early fun psych experiments have a bit of a controversial side. This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Psychology as a field has existed in some form for as long as people have been thinking about thinking. But modern interest in psychology really took off after World War II, partially because millions of new people, whether they be veterans or children of veterans, were just starting to get into college and every school and department was growing. But they also wanted to explain the Nazis. Psychology as a field really wanted to know how or why the Holocaust could have occurred if people are generally good. And could it happen here? The general consensus in America and the rest of the West was that no. It could not have happened here. Americans are fundamentally good and would never do that. It wasn't until a few studies came out in the 60s and 70s that that assumption was challenged. The first major one was by Stanley Milgram. You know who Milgram is. Even if you don't know his name, you're aware of his research. He's the one who came up with six degrees of separation. He called it the small world phenomenon, and before the internet, he tested and figured out that you are connected to any other person on Earth by an average of six links. So a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a f He also studied the idea of the familiar stranger and planted lost letters in various cities to see who would mail them. But he's most famous for the study he conducted in 1961. He ran 18 different variations of this test, but the general story goes like this. Two participants would show up to the office. These were not college students, but people from the community. Grocery store clerks, bankers, electricians, normal everyday people. Other versions of the test also included women and people of color. The experimenter would greet them and inform them that this is a study on memory and learning. They wanted to see if punishment was just as powerful of a motivator as a reward. So rather than getting something for being right, you were punished for being wrong. One of the participants pulls a roll out of a hat to determine who is the learner and who is the teacher. The learner is then strapped into a chair in a separate room with a speaker and four buttons, but no microphone. The teacher returns to the main room with the experimenter, and their job is to recite word pairs to the learner, like blue sky and young boy. Later, the learner is asked to remember the pair. They're presented with the word blue and several multiple choice options, which include the word sky. When the learner inevitably gets something wrong, they're given a shock by the teacher. These start at 15 volts, which isn't much more than licking a nine volt battery. But the more they get wrong, the higher the voltage all the way up to 450 volts. The teachers are often surprised that without a microphone, they can still hear the learner protesting through the walls. Wrong. Answer is neck. 300 volts. In some cases, the learner stopped responding entirely. This caused a few teachers to question whether they should continue. But ultimately, of nearly 800 participants, two-thirds of them ended up giving the non-responsive learner multiple 450-volt shocks. None of the learners successfully memorized all of the word pairs. That's the version of the story you would have been told if you were a participant. If you're at all familiar with psychology, you were probably pulling your hair out. Sorry about that, but some deception was necessary. As was the case with Milgram who is actually studying obedience to authority. In truth, one of the participants was a confederate, someone working with the experimenter. The roles were not randomly assigned. The actual participant was always the teacher. The learner wasn't actually hooked up to anything and was never being shocked. The word pairs didn't matter at all. What they were really testing was whether the teacher would apply what they believed to be a lethal shock to someone when told to continue by an authority figure a scientist in this case. Oftentimes, the participant would protest, but they were verbally urged to continue. I mean, who's gonna take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one, slow. Across all of the variations of this experiment, two-thirds of people flipped the final switch, while the other third quit somewhere along the way. Zero people got up to physically check on the learner. Because someone dressed as a scientist told them to continue, 
most average everyday Americans, including women, would at the very least torture someone with a few painful electric shocks, even if they didn't go all the way. That was unsettling news for many Americans. Nazi war crime trials were going on at the same time, and many of them used the defense that they were just following orders. And now we have a study saying most Americans would just follow orders too. Almost immediately after publication, procedural and ethical questions were raised about Milgram's experiment. They only did it because they were pressured to. Well, yeah, that was the variable being tested. If they wanted to stop and they weren't pressured to continue, they stopped. They lied to participants about what they were testing. If you're told that this is a study on whether people will do terrible things when told to by an authority figure, you're not gonna act normally, are you? The deception was necessary. The participants thought they killed someone. Yeah. Every participant was debriefed and the learner came out to show them that they were okay. Not only were they not dead, but they were never being shocked in the first place. They even interviewed the participants years later and found no lasting psychological damage. But still. The participants know that if something as simple as a wire were connected, they would have killed someone. They flipped the switch thinking they did. They didn't, and they know they didn't but they would have. And while none of the participants reported any lasting mental trauma, knowing that about yourself can really change your perspective. Milgram's study as he performed it probably wouldn't happen today, but his results have been replicated under modern ethical conditions dozens if not hundreds of times. It's pretty well established science. And in the end, his study did follow ethical guidelines for the time. Psychology was an emerging field, and while they did have review boards, they were still figuring out where the boundaries were. Milgram's study was approved by an IRB, as was another famous study which pushed some limits a decade later, known as the Stanford Prison Experiment. As we'll get to, even calling it an experiment is controversial. The usual story is that Dr. Zimbardo took a group of ordinary college kids and randomly assigned them to be either a guard or a prisoner in a mock jail in a basement. The guards were given uniforms, sunglasses, and billy clubs. The prisoners wore smocks and chains and were each assigned a number. Before long, the guards had turned sadistic, abusing the prisoners and having them perform a number of degrading tasks. The experiment got so out of hand that Zimbardo shut it down after only six days. That's the TLDR version you'll find in most Intro to Psychology textbooks, and it's the version Zimbardo has made a career out of telling, usually as a way of discussing the power of the situation over the individual. Just like Milgram's experiment, criticisms of the ethics and procedure came out almost immediately and have been in the background ever since. So it also serves as an example to discuss ethics and science. But unlike Milgram's experiments, there are some questions about whether the Stanford Prison Experiment is scientific at all. And those criticisms have reached a boiling point. A few years ago, a movie was made about the Stanford Prison Experiment called called the Stanford Prison Experiment. Based on Zimbardo's account of events, he even served as an advisor for the film. As far as I can tell, the movie is reasonably accurate. A few characters are composites of different people, and a few of the events are combinations of things that took place separately, but for the most part, it stands up. What I found most interesting about the movie is that if you're aware of the criticism, you'll see it in the movie. It's touched upon several times. But if you only know the textbook version, you might miss it. The first issue is something called selection bias. In Milgram's experiment, the participants were a representative cross-section of society, everyday normal people. The Stanford prison experiment was not. Zimbardo put an ad in the paper reading, Male college students needed for psychological study of prison life, $15 per day for one to two weeks, beginning August 14th. You may not think it, but this is loaded with information that use the pool of potential subjects. Male college students are fine. It's not representative of the population as a whole, but it is for a prison population. And the ad specifically says this is a study about prison life, so only people who have some sort of interest in prisons, positive or negative, are going to apply. Likewise, this is a two-week study near the end of summer, so you're only going to get unemployed college students with free time and an interest in prisons, which is not a representative sample. 70 students applied and were put through a battery of psychological tests and interviews to find the most stable and quote, normal students. They narrowed the list to 24, set aside six as alternates, and divided the remaining 18 students by coin flip into prisoner or guard roles. So far so good. While the selection process only yielded a specific type of person, there shouldn't be any major differences between the two groups at least in theory. It's at this point that I need to explain to you that this study was not originally about the power of the situation, or authority, or assuming roles. It was about the de-individuation of prisoners. We're trying to strip away their individuality. 
That's what the study was originally about. So the guards were under the impression that they weren't the subjects. They were simply there to help the experimenters. On guard orientation day, they were told that they weren't randomly selected by coin flip to be guards. They were specially selected because of their unique qualifications, and that the end goal of this study was to create prison reform. This creates a problem known as demand characteristics. Now that the participants know what you're looking for, they're unconsciously going to try and help you find it. That alone would be bad enough. But in 2011, Stanford made the original tapes and data available to the public, and people have been digging through this new information to find out what actually happened. And it turns out, Zimbardo and his team did a lot more than just hint at what they wanted. Accusations that the guards had been coached have been around forever, but now it's pretty undeniable. Again, it's hinted at several times during the movie. Do not forget, you have all the authority, and you're stronger than they are. They're starting to create bonds with each other. break them up. But they never depict the same level of coaching that was present in reality. In a paper written shortly after the experiment, one of Zimbardo's research assistants stated, Furthermore, even before I arrived, Dr. Zimbardo suggested that the most difficult problem would be to get the guards to behave like guards. I was asked to suggest tactics based on my previous experience as master sadist, and when I arrived at Sanford, I was given the responsibility of trying to elicit tough guard behavior. That previous experience he mentions is actually somewhat important. He ran a small-scale prison experiment in his dorm room as part of a class assignment the previous semester. Zimbardo liked it so much that he wanted to replicate it on a larger scale. They knew the results they wanted before they even started. The goal was to see if they could get ordinary non-criminals to exhibit the same loss of individuality as seen in real prisons. The guards were there to make that happen. During the experiment, one of the guards wasn't quite playing the part, and we have an audio tape of the exchange. We really want to get you active and involved because the guards have to know that every guard is going to be what we call a tough guard. And so far, um, I'm not too tough. Yeah, well, you have to kind of try and get it in you. You don't get to tell a guard to toughen up and then tell the public that it was so weird that the guards spontaneously toughened up all on their own. Zimbardo and his team are aware of this evidence and defend it by saying that vaguely telling a guard to toughen up doesn't necessarily mean that they should be cruel. They thought of the specifics all on their own. So the guards' authority was challenged right off the bat, and the guards had to decide how they were gonna handle that, and they had to decide it without our input. Without their input, Hmm. Zimbardo hired a few ex-convicts to help advise the study and create a realistic prison. While this person is somewhat of a composite character, the person he's based on wrote this op-ed in 2005. Ideas such as bags being placed over the heads of prisoners, inmates being bound together with chains, and buckets being used in place of toilets in their cells were all experiences of mine, which I dutifully shared with the Stanford Prison Experiment Brain Trust months before the experiment started. To allege that all of these carefully tested psychological solid, upper-middle-class, Caucasian guards dream this up on their own is absurd. Let me break this down for you because it's important. The Stanford Prison Experiment is used in psychology classes to demonstrate the idea of attribution. What made you do a specific behavior? Was it an internal motivation? You just felt like doing it because of some past experience or some quirk of your personality? We call that dispositional attribution. It comes from within. Or was it an external motivation? The temperature outside was too high or a customer was just rude to you so you reacted negatively. That's situational attribution. It comes from the environment. The Stanford Prison Experiment was in the news as soon as it started. Zimbardo invited the media to film the mock arrests that began the study. Shortly after the study was shut down, before he could evaluate his results, several real-world prison riots and escapes occurred. And guess who the media asked to weigh in? Zimbardo explained how the power of the situation turned everyday normal people into de-individualized prisoners or sadistic guards. And that's been the narrative ever since. This is a slide from a PowerPoint presentation I used to teach. I used the Stanford Prison Experiment to demonstrate situational attribution, but does it? In a study originally about losing your individuality, Zimbardo and his team instructed the guards to be tough and likely suggested methods to carry that out, 
then turned to the public and said, Isn't it strange that these gods randomly decided to turn into such cruel individuals? Any well-adjusted person put into that role has the potential to do evil things. Any well-adjusted person? I don't know about that. Remember, this was a study on only 18 college students, nine of which were guards, and only three of them were jerks. Most notably, the guard nicknamed John Wayne, who studied acting and put on a fake accent for the entire experiment. He famously said that he wanted to see how far he could take it. That's the self-selection bias at work. If only a third of your sample size turned cruel and you had to push them into it, is that really a valid, significant result? Earlier, I brought up that some people don't like to call this an experiment. It's more of a demonstration or a simulation. There was no control group or even variables. And while the experiment did pass a review board and was approved for funding, Zimbardo seemed to view the IRB as more of a guideline than an actual rule. He played it very fast and loose with the ethics. Everyone who participated in the experiment filled out an informed consent form, which laid out the purpose of the experiment as well as a few rules and expectations, which was thrown out almost immediately. Some loss of freedom was expected, this was a prison study after all, but it very quickly escalated out of control and became physically and emotionally abusive. And they weren't allowed to leave, even after screaming that they wanted out. In Milgram's study, the test was to see when you would quit. You were verbally encouraged to continue, but if you were done, that was it. That's how most studies work. If you want out, you're out. But this was a prison experiment, and if you let people leave at the first sign of trouble, you're not going to get a lot of useful data. So I get why they did it, but that doesn't make it right. Furthermore, the guards worked in shifts. They got to go home every day and take off the uniform. The prisoners did not. They were there around the clock. Now, I want to paint a picture for you, and it's going to be a somewhat dark picture. Imagine you sign up for a psychology study. You interview with the professor and grad students and get selected. A few weeks later, the real police show up to arrest you in front of your neighbors. It's okay, you know this is part of the study. You're brought in, booked like a normal criminal, deloused, and put in a cell. The guards, who are fellow students, are taking this way too seriously and start getting physical. You want out. You ask to talk to the professor, and they bring you to him, only he's not the professor. He's the superintendent of the prison. Prisoner 8612 famously broke down, and in order to assess whether he was faking, Zimbardo interviewed him personally, in character. The professor was no longer an outside observer. He was part of the experiment. Later, your parents come to visit. They're put through the same treatment as real families in real prisons on visiting day, and even act the part, asking if you're well-fed and such. Then you're put in front of a parole board, where you plead for a release to the superintendent and various other faculty who tell you that because you don't seem sincere in your repentance, you will serve the rest of your sentence. The people running the experiment just called you human garbage for committing a crime that you're pretty sure you did. The real police arrested you though. They aren't letting you leave and your parents just visited you for like 15 minutes and said goodbye to you like they'd never see you again. And just to top it off, they bring in a real Catholic priest, not an actor, to tell you this is all real, not an experiment, and the only way you're getting out of this is with the assistance of a lawyer. That actually happened. Zimbardo really did do that. I invited a Catholic priest who had been a prison chaplain to evaluate how realistic our prison situation was. I watched in amazement as half the prisoners introduced themselves by number rather than name. He explained that the only way to get out of prison was with the help of a lawyer. He then volunteered to contact their parents to get legal aid if they wanted him to. That's so unbelievably unethical that it sounds like it should be illegal. Imagine being in that situation. You thought you were in an experiment, but everyone from the police to the professors to your parents to the priesthood are now telling you this is real. Several prisoners had mental breakdowns and had to be sent home. Students, they were students, not prisoners. Even I'm doing it now. The experiment was shut down after only six days rather than waiting the full two weeks. In another break from protocol, the students were paid for their time after the experiment. Normally you pay them before the experiment so as to not influence the results. Many students said that they were financially motivated to stick it out. Zimbardo did not demonstrate the power of the situation. All he did was replicate Milgram's obedience study. Only this time, actual people were being hurt. In Milgram's experiment, the teacher was the only true participant. They were encouraged to inflict punishment on a learner in the other room, who was a confederate and wasn't actually being harmed. The test was to see if the teacher would actually do it, 
which most of the time they did. In Zimbardo's experiment, the role of teacher and learner are replaced with guard and prisoner. The teachers are again encouraged to inflict punishment on the learners who are not Confederates and are actually being harmed. Who is encouraging the guards? Zimbardo and his team. Zimbardo was the scientific authority, the experimenter telling the guards to continue, which just like in Milgram's study, they did. Nobody has been able to replicate Zimbardo's results without including the authority variable, whether that be a physical person or a vague feeling of for the greater good. Replications where they just put people into prisoner and guard roles and don't pressure them to act tough end up looking more like a summer camp environment. Most people aren't naturally inclined to be cruel. There needs to be some sort of external pressure or influence in addition to the role itself. Just putting on a uniform doesn't turn you into a sadist. But Zimbardo has made a career out of telling people just that. In an effort to push prison reform, he's often said that prison abuses aren't the fault of a few bad apples, but bad barrels. Which isn't that spicy of a take, we all know the prison system is bad. But he adds the caveat that therefore, we shouldn't blame the apple. They were just put into a bad barrel. In the decades after the experiment, he has advocated for that view in front of Congress and served as an expert witness in numerous cases of prison abuse for the defense, even famously advocating on behalf of the soldiers responsible for Abu Ghraib. Since nobody has been able to reproduce Zimbardo's results in a laboratory setting, his only supposed replications are real-world scenarios, which isn't how science works. And when you start defending war criminals by using your bogus prison simulation as evidence that they aren't responsible for their actions, you took a wrong turn somewhere. Unfortunately, Zimbardo has positioned himself as the Carl Sagan of psychology. He he loves being on TV, and if you've ever seen a series or documentary on the topic, he was likely the host. It's very unlikely that he'll ever take a second critical look at the one experiment that has defined his career. He has too much to lose at this point. He was even the president of the American Psychological Association for a year. So publishing research that refutes him is… risky. But I'll be interested to see what the academic community does with this new information over the next few months and years. Zimbardo's prison study is still in textbooks. Some psychologists say that it's still a useful example of situational attribution, even if the story is untrue. Even if the science was quirky, or there was something that was wrong about the way that it was put together, I think at the end of the day, I still want students to be mindful that they may find themselves in powerful situations that could override how they might behave as an individual. That's the story that's bigger than the science. So pick a different example. First time frying a turkey. Stay inside, please. Stay, stay inside, inside. Stay inside. Right. Get inside right now. There. Did he yell at her because he's a jerk, or because he's about to deep fry a turkey and she's way too close? Dispositional or situational? So we're all okay with him yelling at her, but what about pushing? Is pushing okay? Maybe. I could see where a light push would be warranted. What about kicking? Would that be okay? Mm, I don't know about that one. So you're saying that while the situation calls for a behavior, there should be limits on that behavior. See how this is a more productive conversation to have than, I guess the power of the situation made them do that. It really isn't that hard to find another example to illustrate the concept that doesn't also perpetuate the narrative that war criminals aren't responsible for their behavior. <sighs> Or maybe you want to run your own ethical study on the power of the situation. A skill you can learn more about by going to skl.sh slash knowingbetter12. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of courses taught by authority figures in their field. Take this course in project management to learn how to set effective goals instead of just vaguely seeing what happens when you put people in a fake prison. Or how to stick to a schedule rather than making things up on the fly. I would specifically recommend this section on reflection and improvement. We can all stand to learn from our mistakes. You can learn this and much more with an annual subscription costing less than $10 a month. And if you head over to skl.sh slash knowingbetter12, you can get two months of unlimited access to all of Skillshare's courses for free. You'll also be supporting the channel when you do. So why couldn't we reflect, improve, and do these studies again? The usual answer is ethics. But that's not true. We've been replicating these studies under ethical conditions since the originals with mixed results, like I said. No, the real issue is that you know about them. The original studies were done in the 60s and 70s. Nobody knew what psychology was or how they tested anything. People walked in as a completely blank slate. Now, as soon as you walk in, before you even fill out the consent forms, you're already trying to figure out what they're actually studying. Is this part of the test? Am I being recorded right now? Are the other participants secretly in on it?
Vsauce attempted to do a recreation of the Milgram experiment, which supposedly shows the opposite, that people won't punish others. But both of the groups mentioned that at some point during the experiment, they doubted that the other team really existed, which they didn't. That's the end of the study right there. If you don't think the other person exists, then pushing the button to send a shock or siren is meaningless at best and defiant at worst. Your knowing so much and trying to figure it out is the problem. I used to work in an EEG lab, and after every Every session, without fail, the participant would ask, so what are you really studying? And I would have to disappoint them with the truth. Most of the time, we're studying what we told you we're studying. Even in the few times we used deception, the thing we were actually studying was even more boring than the fake out. Stop trying to play 4D chess against the experimenters. In the end, I would much rather you know the truth about these experiments and what they demonstrated, or failed to demonstrate. So the next time you see Dr. Zimbardo on TV defending the latest prison guard to succumb to the power of the situation, you'll know better. I'd like to give a shout out to my newest Golden Fork patrons, Seth and Bitrain. If you'd like to add your name to this list of study candidates, head on over to patreon.com slash knowingbetter, or for a one-time donation, paypal.me slash knowingbetter. Don't forget to coach that subscribe button, check out the merch at knowingbetter.tv, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, and join us on the subreddit.